Hi, welcome to Harvard Applied Math 205, a graduate course in scientific computing and numerical methods. In this video, we're going to introduce Unit 3 of the course on numerical calculus. We'll provide an overview of the different subjects we'll consider in this unit, and we'll look at a few motivating examples. Since the time of Newton, calculus has been ubiquitous across the sciences, and in almost every scientific field, we see cases where integrals, derivatives, and ODE models enter in. And often, when we write down problems in calculus, we find that they don't have straightforward, closed-form solutions. And because of this, numerical approximation is essential. And the field of numerical calculus really epitomizes many of the ideas behind scientific computing, where we often want to develop numerical algorithms that can allow us to discreetly approximate the problems of continuous mathematics. In this unit, we're going to look at numerical integration and differentiation. We're going to look at numerically solving ordinary differential equations and numerically solving partial differential equations. And in this video, we're just going to provide a brief overview to these topics. Let's begin by looking at numerical integration. We use the term quadrature for any numerical approximation to a definite integral. And if you've taken a calculus course, then you've probably seen that integration is often introduced by looking at the Riemann sum. And here, if we think about a function, such as this red curve, then we can approximate the integral by drawing a number of rectangles below it, and then summing up the areas of those rectangles. And in the limit, as the width of the rectangles gets smaller, then we'll get our integral result. And this actually provides us with one way to numerically approximate integrals. We could sample them at a number of different points and then construct the integral as just the sum of the areas of the rectangles. In practice, doing integrals this way is not very accurate. And in this unit, we're going to look at much more accurate and efficient methods for performing quadrature. So why is quadrature important? Often, if we're given simple functions, such as exponentials or cosines, then we can just perform those integrals exactly. But it's very easy to write down functions that we can't solve exactly very easily. For example, here, I've composed a number of standard functions together, and this will be something that would be very difficult to integrate exactly. However, this is something that we can do straightforwardly in Python. And here, I'm just showing a few lines of Python that we can use to perform this integral. We can make use of the SciPowder integrate module. And here, I've now defined this function as f of x within the code. I then make a call to the quad routine within the SciPowder integrate module. And this passes back two results. The first one is the value of the integral. And the second one is the error estimated for the integral. And just as in previous parts of this course, it's often really helpful for us to have ways to estimate the error associated with our calculations. Quadrature also generalizes naturally to high dimensions and allows us to integrate functions on irregular domains. For example, suppose we look at a triangle, then we can construct quadrature rules for integrating functions on that triangle by sampling the function at a number of discrete points across the triangle. And I've shown three examples here, and the more points we use, the more accuracy we can get in our quadrature rule. Once we have this quadrature rule for a triangle, then we can now apply this to more complicated domains. So here, I'm looking at a complicated domain where I have a circle, and I've taken several letters out from it. And I've then constructed a triangular mesh over this domain. And now, if I was given a function on this domain, I could integrate it by integrating the function on all the triangles and summing the result. Numerical differentiation is another fundamental tool in scientific computing. And we've already seen the most common intuitive approach for doing this using finite differences. And suppose we have a function f and some small spacing h. Then we can approximate various derivatives in terms of sampling our function f at several points that are spaced distances h away. For example, we've already seen the forward and backward difference formulae, where we take two samples of our function, 
and we can approximate the derivative to odd h accuracy. We can also take two samples of our function at x plus h and x minus h and approximate the first derivative to order h squared accuracy. And we can use another formula that can approximate our second derivative to order h squared accuracy using three samples of our function. In this unit, we're going to look at how we can derive these formulae and others. And we'll see that there are a wide range of choices and trade-offs in terms of accuracy, stability, and complexity. We saw at the start of the course that finite differences can be sensitive to rounding error if h is taken to be too small. However, in practice, we can usually obtain sufficient accuracy with h large enough that rounding error is negligible. Hence, finite differences generally work very well and provide a popular approach for solving problems involving derivatives. The most common situation in which we need to approximate derivatives is to solve differential equations. And we'll first talk about ordinary differential equations, or ODEs, that are differential equations involving functions of one variable. And let's take a look at a few examples. So first, we could look at the equation y prime of t is equal to y squared plus t to the 4 minus 6t, with some condition that y of 0 is equal to y subscript 0. And this will be an example of a first order differential equation because the maximum derivative that appears in the equation is the y prime of order 1. And this would be a initial value problem, or IVP, because we're given data at t equals 0, and we could therefore use the differential equation to solve for t greater than 0. As another example, we could have the equation y double prime of x plus 2xy is equal to 1, with conditions y of 0 is equal to y of 1 is equal to 0. And this would be an example of a second order differential equation, because it involves the second derivative term, y double prime. And it will be an example of a boundary value problem, or BVP, because we're given conditions at two points in space, 0 and 1. And we might want to solve this differential equation over the interval in between. And therefore, those conditions that we're given are conditions at the boundaries of the interval of interest. A familiar IVP ODE that we encounter is Newton's second law of motion. And suppose that we have a particle whose position is y of t for t greater than or equal to 0 then Newton's law tells us that the acceleration on the particle, y double prime, is equal to f of t and y and y prime, so a force that depends on time, position, and velocity of the particle, and that would be divided by the mass of the particle m. And to solve this problem, we would require knowing the particle's position and velocity at some reference time 0. This is a scalar ODE, so we're only solving here for a scalar y. But it's common to simulate problems like this for systems of n interacting particles. For example, the f here could represent the gravitational force due to other particles, and then the force on particle i could depend on the positions of all of the other particles. And these n-body problems are often used in many situations. And we saw one example of this in Unit 0, where we were looking at cosmological simulations for galaxy formation. And here, we will be interested in a very large number of interacting particles, and therefore, efficient numerical methods to solve the resultant differential equations will be very important. ODE boundary value problems are also important in many circumstances. For example, suppose you want to calculate the steady state heat distribution in a one-dimensional rod. Then 
we could solve for the temperature in the rod, u of x, and let's suppose that there is a heat source applied to the rod, f of x, and we'll say this is equal to x squared, and we could have boundary conditions on the rod temperature at either end, so we could impose that at x equals zero, the temperature is equal to some reference temperature, and we'll just scale this to be equal to zero. So we're not thinking here of absolute zero temperature, but just some rescaled reference temperature. And at the other end of the rod, x equal one, we could impose an insulation condition. So in this case, our steady state temperature would satisfy the ODE BVP minus u double prime of x is equal to x squared, with the conditions that u of zero is equal to zero, and u prime of one is equal to zero. And we could solve this problem using finite differences to approximate our ODE, and we would get a heat distribution as shown in this graph. It's also natural to generalize this to look at the time-dependent distribution of temperature in a rod. So now, u would be a function of both position x and time t. And in this case, the derivatives of u would now be partial derivatives, and we would therefore obtain a partial differential equation, or PDE. So, in this one-dimensional rod case, we could write down the following PDE. We could say that du by dt minus d squared u by dx squared is equal to x squared, and we could have that the initial temperature of the rod is equal to this reference temperature zero, so we have a condition u of x at zero is equal to zero, and then we have our two boundary conditions that u at zero for all time t is equal to zero, and du by dx at one at all time t is equal to zero. And this is an example of a initial boundary value problem because we combine initial conditions with boundary conditions as well. We can generalize this picture to more than one dimension, which is useful for modeling a wide variety of continua that we encounter in real world problems. For example, the three dimensional analog of our heat equation on some domain omega in R3 can be written as du by dt minus d squared u by dx squared minus d squared u by dy squared minus d squared u by dz squared is equal to f as a function of x, y, and z. And we would also have some boundary condition, for example, that u is equal to zero on the boundary of omega. And this equation can typically be written as du by dt minus the Laplacian of u is equal to f. And frequently when we're dealing with multidimensional problems, it's helpful for us to use the language of multivariable calculus, for example, the Laplacian or the gradient or divergence. As an example, we could add a transport term to our heat equation to obtain the convection diffusion equation. So in two dimensions, if we have a vector with components w1 and w2, then we could write down an equation du by dt plus w1 comma w2 dotted with a gradient of u minus the Laplacian of u is equal to f of x and y. And the effect of this term involving the gradient is to move our solution with velocity given by this vector with components w1 and w2. And this could model a wide variety of different situations. In particular, we could think of u now as being a concentration of some substance, for example, a pollutant in a river. And here, the river current would be modeled with w1 and w2. And if we solved an equation like this, then we might have the following result. So we could have a tight concentration of our pollutant to begin with, and that would both diffuse over time and also move over time. 
Numerical methods for partial differential equations is a huge topic in scientific computing. And you may recall from the start of the course we gave several other examples, such as in computational fluid dynamics or in geophysics. And the finite difference method is an effective approach for solving a wide range of partial differential equations, and we'll focus on this in Applied Math 205. However, there are actually many other approaches that we can use, such as finite volume methods, finite element methods, or spectral methods. And if you're interested in these, then I have a course that's offered in the spring, Applied Math 225, that covers a number of these in detail. In summary, numerical calculus encompasses a wide range of important topics in scientific computing. And in the coming videos, we'll explore many of these different areas. And as always, we'll pay attention to stability, accuracy, and efficiency of the algorithms that we consider.